The Penom are a minority people group living in Cambodia's northeastern province of Mondulkiri. For centuries, they have lived a semi-nomadic life by foraging in the vast forest and by growing rice on slash and burn farms. Geographic isolation has allowed them to remain entirely dependent on the land. The journey to Phnom Penh used to take three days rough drive through the forest. Now it takes just eight hours. Open access inevitably brings rapid change. Now, the Benong face a new economy and a new civil society. They must learn to work within national land and forest laws. Formal education and literacy have never before been a value in this traditionally oral culture. So how will the Benong learn to operate as Cambodian citizens whilst maintaining their own unique culture? เมื่อจานะแรนมูฮอมออกมูชาแรนดิบังละกะแลนะปูรายกะแลละกะรีชาซอหอมมาชาเปียงโอ้รีบหลังเนิบเรียนแต่ละจอบดังกุมันเด้
The World Food Programme, who uh, is uh, the, one of the major organisations that tackles hunger in the world, suggests that indigenous ethno-linguistic minorities are in an inferior economic and social position in contrast with the mainstream populations of the world because minority peoples are isolated from some of the benefits of development. There are barriers that may be language barriers or cultural barriers or political barriers. They may be, may be passive, they may not be intentional, or they may be highly explicit and intentional in order to disempower communities. They can be dis formal discriminatory legislation and both those situations are found in the countries of the world. But the World Food Programme says that the result for the children of indigenous minorities, ethno-linguistic minorities, is that the incidence of malnutrition or hunger among these communities is higher. They continue to say that the um, issues of distance, remoteness, people who are disempowered because of their relationship with the authorities in their country, the result is that less is spent on health and education for minorities than tends to be spent for the majority language communities of the world. And as it says here, the communities that hold little political sway, whose pa who, who are at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of the power to which they have access, <coughs> tend to be developmentally disadvantaged. This is a very common um, quote that many of us who are involved in multilingual education look at. 50% of the world's out-of-school children, so if you think about that, those are the children who don't go to school, 50% of them live in communities where the language of schooling is rarely, if ever, used at home. So you have this disconnect between education that is provided in schools, in the community, and the home and social environment in which those children live. Education for All, which is mentioned here, is a, a, a UN initiative to get children into school, to have quality education in school. And this, the language issue, for particularly for minority language children, is one of the biggest hindrances to effective education. That we have a legacy, as it says here, of non-productive practices that language education in schools tends to have been developed in relation to um, um, the principles of the colonizers, shall we say. If you go to India, the, the pra colonial practice of education inherited from my forefathers in the United Kingdom is the basis on which education is established. And that is not appropriate for India in the 21st century. And you may find that in the Americas from inheriting some of the Spanish and Portuguese practices. It is found in the Philippines where, the, where I live, where the practice of education is inherited from the, 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 the US system. Throughout the world, the, the legacies of non-productive practices have led to low levels of learning and high levels of dropout and repetition. In essence, we don't have responsive systems that, that take in children's language and their culture, and therefore we are not, the access to quality education is not there. So, poverty, um, hunger, education, civil unrest and poverty. In Nepal, the, the, um, the World Bank has set up what they call the Poverty Alleviation Fund. And they did this in response to some of the Maoist conflict that exists there, that continues to exist there. And they did it to address some of the root causes of conflict. 
The root causes of conflict have been identified by the, this agency, the World Bank, as poverty, inequality and lack of services. But who are they targeting? The marginalised and excluded, and those that are marginalised and excluded because of gender, because of caste, ethnicity and location. The issues relating to minority language communities in Nepal are, are exacerbated by the civil unrest that's there. And there's actually connection between those that are looking for um, improved quality of life, those that link into some of the, the rebellious activities that are going on, and those that have no access to education, whose language and whose culture have been devalued within their social system. And if you consider most of the areas of conflict in the world today, and those that spring to mind immediately to me are places like Iraq and Kenya, Myanmar, southern Thailand, Mindanao in the Philippines, sadly over the last few days Tibet, um, and Israel, almost every major conflict in the world today is dealing with issues that relate to culture, to language, or to identity. And I believe, and we've heard that over the last two days, and very strongly last night, that the church needs to respond in appropriate ways to these issues. And I believe that those of us who are part of faith-based organizations that can intervene along in these situations, who can get alongside the peoples of the world, we need to devise and listen and develop appropriate responses to these, these situations. Last night, when um, we were listening to the situation in, about Rwanda and the Tutsis and the Hutu, we heard the, the phrase, where sin abounds, grace abounds more abundantly. And when we consider issues to do with civil unrest, about poverty and education and these various things, we need to think we are the people of God who are stepping into this situation. And sin abounds, but we take grace because we are taking the Holy Spirit along with us. Yeah, the peace process in Nepal continuing. This is DFID, the Department for International Development from the UK government. They say that in addressing the peace process, the background to the conflict is deep-seated poverty, poor governance, and discrimination. They talk about poverty. And then they say, but, but for the um, <coughs> poverty levels have declined in the, between 96 and 2004, but it was uneven. Because for excluded ethnic communities, the poverty um, level is almost double the national average. As Christians, I believe that we need to establish a biblical worldview as we consider our work with minority language communities, as we consider our work wherever we are, but with minority language communities. Scripture has clearly reminded us in both the Old and the New Testaments that everything in the world is created by God. And it's created by God it's created through the Father, and God's creation was, by definition, it was good. It was perfect and beautiful. It's Psalm 24. I love it. Whenever, I, Wherever I am, I think about Psalm 24, and it says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell within. And as you come here to Orlando or wherever you travel, think about that that Jesus Christ was who is here, as we see in Colossians, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is the one, he is our Christ, the son of the living God. But by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, think about the nations of the world. They were established by God the Father. And he 
in Christ is before all things and in him all things hold together. And that scripture is one of the, the, the driving forces for me to see our work network, our, our, our work with minority language communities linked in to what God is doing in the world today. God's determination to be worshipped and loved by the nations is so clear, and it was mentioned well this morning by, by Chris Seipel. Genesis, Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, is one of the central texts of the Bible because God says much more to Abraham than just, I will bless you. The, he says, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing to the families of the earth. And that kind of that second phrase is, is crucial because if it's only I will bless you, it's kind of receiving only. But it's I will bless you in order that you can be, you will be a blessing to the families of the earth. And God brings that blessing to those who are in relationship with himself in order that we can be a blessing to others. There's a real biblical imperative to live out this tangible compassion for the marginalized communities of the earth. It's not just a nice feeling. It's a biblical worldview. It's to say, we saw it was again mentioned this morning, in Exodus and in Leviticus, it's clear. And it's, it comes out in the New Testament because Paul, he rejoices in the fact that as a result of his mission, those who were formerly aliens and strangers to Israel have now been brought fully into being the people of God through Jesus. And so through Christ, they are brought into being the people of God. And I, I, I feel that we are to, to look at the goodness of God's creation. <coughs> Oops. Thank you. The goodness of God's creation, where God, is, he created the heavens and the earth and the plants and everything in it. He declared his creation that was good. But then God said, I will give man dominion over the earth, not just to use as, as, as we wish, but in order to care for it reverently and carefully on God's behalf. And human life is in itself sacred because human life contains within it, as we've heard often over this last day or so, the image of God himself. I mean, we know that sin has distorted and it's negatively impacted um, that original perfection, but there's still the reflection of God in everything that's there. And the, the, the verse that we all sort of learned as young children, perhaps, where in, in John chapter 3 it said, for God so loved the world that he gave. It, it reminds me that it wasn't that God loved people who loved him first. But God loved the world, and because of that, he gave his son. And so that every single person on earth is the reflection of Christ. Wherever they are and whatever they're doing, they are the reflection of Christ. And as we go to, to wherever we are, whether we're in Africa or China or Thailand or here in the, in the United States, each person, as we see them and we, we walk past them, they're, they're a reflection of Christ, whether male or female. They're, and I believe there's no more powerful way to express the love of God than demonstrating the value of language and culture that uniquely belongs to each one of these people. If we reflect with these, the people here that we value them and their language and their religion and their culture and we choose to begin where they are and listen to them, then God 
can... God is so much bigger than we are. And God will honor that relationship and take it and use it for his glory. I want to share with you my dream. My dream is that there will be a context in every minority language community in Asia which will equip people to live and act with a true realization of their identity and their position in Christ. Throughout scripture, we see that um, God is concerned with poverty and hunger and human suffering and conflict and injustice and corruption. And if we're going to be God's people working alongside the Po Karin in the north of Thailand as these people are, then we should share his concern for justice and reconciliation throughout human society and the liberation of men and women from issues relating to poverty and oppression. And I believe that the lie, and this is why I've called these slides release from deception, the lie that many communities deal with is that they are not valuable in the sight of others. And if they are not valuable in the sight of their national government or the sight of the national language speakers, then what does God care about them? And that lie is one that I believe we need to address and help people realize that there, that there is good news in a gospel that says to them that they, in their language and their culture, are valuable to a loving Heavenly Father. We want to help people see themselves and their world differently to help them come out of poverty. And I think God is calling people together. The phrase, a context, which equips people, that context, the world in which they live so that their community is involved. The national government is involved. The multilateral and bilateral agencies that impact their country are involved so that the leadership in their community have access to other leaders to talk about who they are and their development needs. We want people to be equipped in order that they themselves can address their development needs, whether it be in education or healthcare, so that there is an integrated, holistic response to the needs within the community. Within education, there has traditionally, within our, our SIL system, been a model where people go and do for others. And that has, over the years, been something that has reflected a, a, a degree of success. But for a sustainable movement where communities can rise out of their feeling of powerlessness to be empowered to address their needs, we need to equip people in a way where they can act responsively to their own needs. People, yeah, to live and act, not just be receivers of, other, of what others are doing, but be complete participants in what um, is, is happening. Their identity and their position in Christ. That context that we're developing so that people realize that they are, are ready to respond. We are not the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we wish we were. We are not the ones who can make the decisions about when and where and how and why people come to a, a situation where they can accept Christ. But we can be there and can be listeners and interact with people so that they can realize that they are valuable to a father who loves them. Their identity and their position in Christ. Because things like poverty and hunger and marginalization and injustice should be abnormal. And they're not part of God's original plan for the nations. And this inequity that we have in society, which has been caused by lack of access to education and health care, 
They are part of the injustice of the world. And if you look through scripture, God hates injustice. And so should we, because they're it's symptoms of a deeper problem of separation from God. And I believe that people need to be transformed through faith in Jesus Christ. But this transformation must, as we heard so beautifully this morning, work its way out to all of society, the unjust structures of society that exist. This transformation that is, in, that is there, we need to engage with structures of society. Because if we don't, we're just working in one box over here rather than a holistic transformational ministry where people know that they are God's people. They are there. I would like you to take your Bibles just for a moment. We've got, we're going to have some time. And I just want you to pick up your Bible and quickly, but everything's in the Old Testament. So Psalms or Proverbs or Isaiah. And we're just going to spend three or four minutes on this. So you need to do it fairly quickly. And just pick a verse at your table. And I'd like you just to think about what are the key words or the key concepts that you read in that verse that you've you look at it. In Psalm 47, in Psalm 41, what are the key words that you can see in those verses? If someone has found a verse, would you like to read it out loud and then we'll try and... Um, 47 verse 9, can someone read that one out loud? Princes of the people have assembled themselves as the people of God, of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly Okay, the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. What, what truth do you hear in that scripture? I hear, I'll tell you what I hear. I hear that God cares about governance systems. God cares about the ways in which people are governed. And God wants to People wants to be part of governance systems, part of the political processes of this world. Can someone read Psalm 41, verses 1 to 3? Blessed is he who considers the poor. Yahweh will deliver him in the day of evil. Yahweh will preserve him and keep him alive. He shall be blessed on the earth, and he will not surrender him to the will of his enemies. Yahweh will, will sustain him on his sickbed and restore him from his bed of illness. Thank you. What do you hear in that verse? Who should we care about? Remember I said you need to talk to me because I, I, I will panic if you don't talk to me. What do you hear in that verse? He cares about the sick. He cares about the sick, yes. Anything else? The poor. He cares about the poor. Restoration. I'm so, he cares about restoration. And I hear that there's blessing both ways. Because for those who do care about the poor and the sick and others, there will be blessing that comes there too. Psalm 146. Read that one on your own. It's a bit long. Proverbs 31, verses 8 to 9. Can someone read that one out loud? Okay, what's the key word there, Sandra? You were reading... Speak out. We're called to speak out for the poor, and needy. the poor and needy. But what's the key word that comes out there for the, the speechless, but for the rights? You see, we, we sometimes a little bit reticent to think about rights-based in, interventions. What about human rights? What about freedom? We talk, we've talked a lot this morning about religious freedoms. What about the rights that are stated within the UN conventions for linguistic rights, for the rights of children to have education in their own language, for the rights of, um, yeah, for rights relating to um, the, the maintenance of, of your own culture? Do we consider issues to do with national and international conventions when we stand alongside others? Are we willing to be advocates for those who are powerless 
And are we willing to equip people in order that they can be advocates for their own rights? I'd love to be more, much to be able to stand along people and for them to speak out and be able to express their right to use their language, to use their culture, to be all that God intended them to be. Um, Isaiah is a bit long. Um, Isaiah chapter 1, 15 to 17. Can someone read that one? There's such a strong mandate within scripture for releasing the oppressed. Jesus talks about it in in Luke, about release for the oppressed. And it tells us that we need to look towards those that have been disempowered. There's a lot of implications, I believe, for in scripture, and I need to (coughs) hurry a bit. There's implications for how we engage with people. And this morning, we received from the the Institute for Global Engagement their principles of engagement. And I want to read number five, because that, for me, kind of sums up so much of what we're talking about here. We need to pray for the full armor of God. Be transparent, predictable, accountable, and responsible. And make hope tangible in the present. Take no credit give away learning, act incarnationally, and establish the worth of the gospel so that the truth might be revealed. That's a tremendous statement. And I've kind of, you know, previously to to reading that, I put together a list of things and it's, this is great, (laughs) but this is my list. Respect. I wrote this last week. And the word respect is coming up again and again and again. That respect is not just being willing to put up with somebody, but is to honor and to love people. To be willing to be reconciled with others because the core of the gospel is about respect and reconciliation. Empowerment. We want to work alongside people to be listeners so that people can take charge of their own development process. So that we are not, as outsiders, directing and, decision, and making decisions about development interventions. But that we're working alongside others to promote community-based, whatever that community might be, community-based decision making. We want to develop training that's transferable so that the outsider, you in Wycliffe or SIL, doesn't need to be the one to train everybody again and again and again and again. But that transferable training means that we cascade training from person to person to person so that the training capacity exists within the community in order that training can be adopted and then adapted to reflect the needs of the community. There needs to be transparent partnering, as was brought out in the principle here, in order that people realize that language and development work is not simply a means to another end. It's not a door opener. I get so sad and a bit frustrated at times when people say, oh, we do literacy or we do multilingual education in order to open doors. I'm sorry, I do literacy. I am thoroughly um, passionate about literacy and multilingual education and engagement in relation to education because people need it. And it it helps people um, have access to development choices that they are um, denied 
because of the oppressive systems of this world. And I believe that as, as God has equipped me, I will continue to work towards justice in the education systems and the development systems of the world. And I would like us, there's some of you here who are recruiters, to be thinking in those terms as we think about social justice issues. The church in the UK in particular at the moment is, is absolutely um, immersed in issues to do with social justice. And how do we respond as Christians to the issues of justice? And I believe that there are segments of the church here in the US who are wanting to hear how mission in its broadest sense, we've talked about the missional church, how the missional church will respond to social justice issues. So transparent partnering is, is, is necessary there. We're doing it because of sustainable impact. Sustainable impact in that we want people to know their identity and their position in Christ in the long term. It's not going to happen in two years or five years or ten years. The Spirit may intervene and it may happen immediately. But we don't know because that's not what we are in control of. And we need to, I believe, have a, have a prayerful attitude to all of this and say, Father, take what we can be involved in because we're part of what you are doing how do we operationalize this this is all very nice you know it's all good theory and it's all very nice but we need to operationalize it at a, at a level of working in maybe in a country or maybe in a region we need to think how do we operationalize it in relation to working in a community because the, the scriptural principles are very direct. But we need to think, how do we as Wycliffe and SIL and our other organizations represented here operationalize things related to language and development work for minority language communities throughout the world? Now, I've asked Paul, you heard yesterday that we, we talked about a, a system of doing um, language and development work in um, a way that is transparent and where we're operationalizing a way of responding to different needs in different communities. So he's going to talk about that one there. Okay. Hi there. I, I'm going to try and speak with this mic even though I bounce around a lot and I, uh, so I might fumble with the mics a bit here. All right. Oh. Um, I'm the director of something called Bangladesh Advance. Bangladesh Advance is a partnership between Wycliffe International and SIL International. So we're not an SIL entity and we're not a Wycliffe organization. We're a joint initiative uh, for Bangladesh of both Wycliffe and SIL. And I'm um, just going to tell you what we're doing. Um, we are the Bangladesh-based expression of Wycliffe and SIL's commitment to the vision that the whole church and the whole development community will be engaged in the whole task of seeing every language group transformed by their interaction with God's living word made meaningful to them. So, um, basically what this is saying is we have a big picture view of our work. Um, we, I did not go to Bangladesh, uh, I went there in 2004, and I did not go there to make sure that a Bible translation project was underway for every people group that needed one, that language community that needed one in Bangladesh. I went there to see that Vision 2025 was complete. Um, and that is a much bigger vision than just that simple sentence, that there should be a Bible translation project underway. It's about transformation. The way we do things first, the way we see ourselves even before that, um, but ultimately in the, the country of Bangladesh as a whole. So we decided to look at the big picture. Um, and the core principles, as we looked at that, were let's, let's not assume that our best investment is to go really deep in a really small place. Um, let's assume that if we're going to change this country and the way it works, we're going to have to invest in a really high level and in ways that are really strategic. So instead of going, having a big impact in a small place, let's try and invest for at least a little while and see how this works having a small impact in a big place. 
Let's see if we can influence the whole context in at least some key ways. Let's partner transparently and intelligibly with natural networks of partners. For two and a half years before going to Bangladesh, I worked in the SIL Asia area office trying to get us to partner, to do partnership, because we're, we've been working on this. You know, what's, what, what are the important pieces of this Vision 2025 thing of getting it right? Well, partnership is a really important piece. So, okay, let's go partner. Hey, you, Paul, partner. Okay, uh, yes, Larry. Um, we'll partner. So I went out and was looking for partners and, um, and I figured out pretty quickly that the partners I was trying to talk to in the Asian Development Bank and the partners in the International Missions Board and the partners in the church I was attending in Manila didn't really see the point of sitting at the table with one another. They had completely different natural networks. Um, and in order to have an impact in a broad sense, we need to be very aware of the natural networks of partners that exist and to relate to people in a way they understand. Facilitate movements. It's never going to be enough for us to run projects. We have to catalyze change, like Catherine said, by helping people train others and train others and train others and start a movement that changes something specific. So, we're committed to facilitating movements and we focus those in three areas. Language and development is one of those areas. Scripture partnerships or scripture engagement and missions mobilization. So basically we identified three different kinds of impact that we want to have at a big level for the whole country. And we said let's organize ourselves to see a movement happen in each of those three spheres of operations. And um, how can we use sharp tools, global best practices in each of those areas? And how can we do that in a way that is genuinely empowering to others? So that means not just getting really good, say, at a particular domain of linguistics and going and applying it at, uh, in one or two languages. But how can we ask ourselves the question of, the people who are really trying to influence big contexts, what kinds of processes are they using? And um, let's get good at this whole transformation business. Um, what does it mean to use best practices in that area? Um, and if linguistics can support that, great. Let's, let's get good at that too and figure out how that relationship works. And how can we create empowering professional structures, relationships, etc., in support of and in submission to specific movements of partners so we can foster transformative impact. So these are the three, now I'm gonna wander. Um, oh. Hey, are we up? Can I, I'm up here, okay. These are the three spheres or the three areas of operations, language and development, uh, scripture partnerships, oops, that didn't work, and missions mobilization, Ooh, there. So um, basically, our members are organized into three sub-teams, one for each of these three movements and each of the sub-teams has the job of catalyzing a movement in the country. Um, so we, and re in relationship again to a specific network of partners, so the development movement relates to development partners, which means government, NGOs, community members themselves, and they are trying to organize, a sp each one of the movements again is trying to organize a specific unit um, of the, at the core of their movement. So um, this, the heart of this movement for development is community movements for ethno-linguistic diversity and development, or language and development committees. We want to help the whole community organize itself to achieve its development goals. The core unit of this movement for scripture impact is the kingdom impact partnership. We want to see a kingdom impact partnership or a kingdom impact movement for every single language in Bangladesh. And that's a different set of partners again. Those are people who already are committed to seeing the gospel go forward in that people group. Um, and over there, um, in missions, we want to help the church in Bangladesh get involved in missions. Well, what's the natural unit of organization uh, in God's plan for missions? It's the church. Um, and so we want to help every church in Bangladesh have a, a missions movement uh, or a missions committee, if you will, in some of the more traditional structures. Um, and so what we're saying is research training and consulting for diversity and development over here. Research training and consulting for kingdom impact in people groups here and research training and consulting for missions engagement of the church here. So when these partners organize themselves, then we help them take action at that level. But again, they're the ones doing it, not us.
um, again, a little bit great commission either. This is going to people where they're at. This is focusing on the discipleship piece primarily. And this is teaching them to obey the great commission. Um, okay. The, Catherine wanted me to zoom in a little bit on the language and development piece. Um, the goal is to see that every language community in Bangladesh has the support and resources it needs to achieve its development goals while fully embracing its ethno-linguistic identity. And um, operations here focus on equipping Bangladeshi language communities to organize themselves in order to be successful in ethno-linguistic diversity and development matters. And the operational heart of this sphere is the Bangladesh-based NGO, SIL Bangladesh, which does research, training, and consulting for ethno-linguistic diversity and development, which we abbreviate to ethnodev. Um, yeah, this is, I, I spent two years of my life studying globalization um, here in, in the US and in Italy. And uh, my father's Italian, my mother's British. I was born here and raised in about 10 countries before I went to university. Globalization is a big deal. It's, to me, it's the process by which uh, all of humanity comes to live in a s single, social unit. Might sound scary, but it's real. Um, and that means that uh, 7,000 languages, I don't know how to do the math on this, but 7,000 language communities have to relate to 6,999 other language communities each. And we have to figure out a way to do that without being in perpetual conflict with one another. This is the number one social problem of a globalized world. Um, and we in Wycliffe and SIL uh, have tools to help the world deal with the kinds of identity conflicts, uh, as Doug shared with us, um, that, that are happening in the world today. Are we gonna organize ourselves to do it? Um, that's what we're trying to do. Um, I'd love to hear your input on this privately later um, and talk more about it. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to be a part of this with you all and be talking about these things. There's some key phrases in this that, that I feel are very important. We're equipping Bangladeshi or Thai or others to organize themselves so that others can be successful. For so long, I think that traditional missions have focused, I, I think we heard a bit of a reflection on that this morning, have been results oriented so that we can report on our degree of success rather than being able to equip others so that they can be successful so that ethno-linguistic diversity can be a value that we as the church reflect to others i want to just leave two two questions with you we won't have time to discuss them we're, we're nearly over um, but We'll leave these questions with you. What are the best development practices that you know that could result in practical blessing, empowering change within individuals, within people groups, and within nations? You know, I work a lot alongside UNESCO and UNICEF and a bit alongside Save the Children and other organizations. And some of the stuff they do, you know, as some people have said, you know, it's a bit iffy. You know, some of it's not as well organized as we'd like. But there's some great stuff out there that other people are doing that we can learn from. And yet we think we are a Christian faith-based organization, so we know what we're meant to do. But I want us to be learners from others. How can we see change happen? And what are the best practices that we should be employing? And what organizations are well positioned to help the world and the church address the development issues that minority language communities face? Let's be integrated into the big picture of what God is doing in the world. Because to God, it matters. Because God cares about the nations. He cares about the governance of the countries. And he wants us to be where he is, working alongside the poor of the world, in order that they might know their identity, and they might know that God cares for them where they are today, that they might know him forever. So I'd be happy to discuss any of this with others at a different time, and 
um, I pray that we will together move ahead as SIL and different agencies in working alongside minority communities. Thank you.